This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 115 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Robin Pierce all about time management for indie authors in 2022. But first, to last week's question, which was, how do you work with deadlines? So the question actually got posted in uh, my Slack, and there were a ton of responses. So Helen said, serious answer, I have to be a bit careful about deadlines. If I set one before I know how long a task takes, it stresses me out. I work best when I'm getting ahead on not urgent but important tasks. So I tend to have desired deadlines and I get started on my stuff way before then. Amy said, I prefer to work this way as well, from a position ahead to avoid that stress. That lovely sound is the hoover. (laughs) by the way, if you wanted to know. Um, Matt said, I suck at deadlines. If I'm familiar with a task, I can usually complete the deadline quite easily. If I fall behind, then I get really discouraged, which adds to my sense of shame and lack of self-worth regarding that task. This is, it's very excessive hoovering that's going on today, Uh, which then means I, that I procrastinate on it. So it falls further behind and I feel worse. And so it goes. I work way better without deadlines and in a collaborative environment. Lynn Fiona said, uh, I vary and I don't know why. Sometimes I'm super motivated by them and other times I leave it to the last minute and other times I have no intention of sticking to them. Judith Mortimer said, I get far more done when I do have a deadline, hence my liking for NaNoWriMo. I'm the sort of person that thinks I have plenty of time until I don't and then I have to do things in a rush. But often the things I do uh, in a rush are better than the ones I've agonised over for a week. That's interesting. Dan Wilcox tends to say uh, he writes better books when he goes quickly as well. Uh, Melissa Klimo said, um, I work well in advance of deadlines too, as life has a habit of getting in the way unexpectedly right before a deadline. Oh my God, I so... (laughs) Like, I swear the universe does it on purpose. Um, And I hate the last minute chaos and madness. Having said that, I am pressure prompted. Oh, me too, honey, me too. Shane said, not sure about a deadline, but I like to set monthly goals and work to those within the month. And I find if I pick three or four things per month and focus on only those, that works for me. Next in, Sarah Louise said, I thought I liked deadlines and would always have everything done way in advance. But over the last year or so, and especially with writing for some reason, I've watched them whoosh by. I feel the same as uh, Matt. I also find it harder with tasks that are new to me, or I don't know how long they're going to take. I always under... uh, I do this as well. I always underestimate the time required. And as I slip behind, I get demotivated. The longer it goes on, the harder it is to start. And then I panic and and have a surge of work. I know I definitely do better when I have a plan though. So that's really interesting because I definitely um, have gone through a period of like being very resistant to deadlines. I don't remember if I talked about that on this podcast, but basically over the lockdown and all the pandemic and everything, I failed to hit a number of deadlines and basically lost faith in my ability to ever work with deadlines. Um, But as you'll see (laughs) in the personal section today, that's over now. Um, Okay, so Carrie Hardisky says, I used to be terrible with headlines, and I think this is Facebook. Um, Late nights in tears before school assignments are due, uh, hoping I've done the bare minimum not to fail. Now I have the flexibility to arrange things as life and procrastination calls for it. That may change once I'm published. I don't want to have five years between books. Ian Worrell says, work out how much I need to get done per day and do what I can to get above the minimum required, just in case something happens. Very sensible, very sensible. Okay, this week's question is, what is your favorite book of 2021? So I would love to know, we're drawing close to the end of the year, there's only a couple of episodes left. So I would like to know what book you read that was really standout. And if you want to give me, like you're welcome to give me a non-fiction, a fiction and an audiobook, 
work if you like, or um, just one, it's completely up to you. But I would love a gigantic list of uh, your favourite books from 2021. Okay, so my book recommendation this week is a little different. I am recommending a kid's book uh, for Christmas because Christmas is coming up and I always think it's nice to give kiddos um, the, the gift of story or, or at least information in the form of a book. So if you have a kiddo in your life who is, I would say, anything from six, uh, maybe up to 12, I think this book would probably be um, ideal. So this is called Kay's Anatomy um, and he, uh, Adam Kay wrote it and obviously it's a play on Grey's Anatomy which was the old school medicine um, anatomy textbooks um, and Adam Kay also wrote the sort of uh, first year resident uh, doctor expose called This Is Going To Hurt which was like a New York Times bestseller. Anyway the second book that he's released in this kids medicine series is called Kay's Marvelous Medicine and we are reading that one right now. We read Kay's Anatomy earlier in the year. It is a fantastic book and resource for kids. Um, it covers science and the body and anatomy and uh, in this new one it's uh, the, the case Marvelous Medicine is looking at the history of medicine and like the discoveries that went on and like weird things that people did in history uh, to cure ailments and um, it is quite fantastic it's mentioned how Hippocrates uh, yeah how Hippocrates and Aristotle were kind of at odds Aristotle ruined Hippocrates Hippocrates work uh, saying that the brain was kind of the source of of, of all of our selves or whatever and uh, and Aristotle although he got many things right said that it was the heart and so Atlas has been learning about that and and Aristotelian logic and all of this kind of stuff and the teachers are like what but because it's done in a fun way with toilet humor all about poo and bums and things he's taking it all in and I just think it is magical so yeah if you have a kiddo perhaps a niece or a nephew or a child um, or a cousin or whatever if you have somebody in your life who is maybe like 6 to 12 if they're on the six end then maybe you or an adult would have to read to them but certainly at least my kids are not being really noisy out there, <laughs> then um, I highly, highly, highly recommend this book and um, I'm going to leave links in the show notes. Okay, so personal update. Um, I think I must have, <laughs> because I'm seeing I don't remember, but I must have mentioned that the absolute monster marathon that I was on to get Trey done. Now, I don't remember the exact final figures now a few days later, uh, but essentially I had to read the whole book and edit the whole book and uh, in one week. Well, actually it ended up being six days uh, because I was still outlining on the last on the first day. Um, and the book ended up thus far at 115,000 words, which is longer than anything I've ever written. I know that's not long for some people, but it's bloody long for me. My, my The first two books in the series, I think, were 67 and 87K or 65 and 87, something like that. Anyway, um, and I think I wrote 21 or 22,000 words last week. Uh, and suffice to say, after pulling a ridiculously long Sunday um, and a equally long Monday, I managed to hit the deadline. And I cannot explain to you <laughs> the relief, the joy, the satisfaction, the elation that I felt hitting this deadline. Um, so this deadline was not imposed by me, it was imposed by my uh, strengths coach. And um, it was there to help re restore my faith in myself and my ability to hit deadlines, because I haven't hit any of my <laughs> self-imposed deadlines in whew, I don't know like two years at least at least yeah at least since the bloody COVID shite um so yeah I I definitely feel empowered again I feel like I have self-belief and the funny thing is I was so fucked I was like literally ruined at the end of it that I had to climb into bed to stave off a migraine uh, and turn off all the lights and I was exhausted I am still exhausted I went on the school run in odd shoes today like that should explain to you I tried to put my bloody dirty coffee cup back in the cupboard <laughs> 
yesterday. I am so tired, my brain is not on. Um, but interestingly, both my wife and my dad, uh, in separate conversations, turned around to me and was like, wow, like you are glowing. And I'm like, am I, am I? Anyway, and um, I think it is genuinely, um, like the competition in me won because I hit the deadline that I was trying to beat. And so I have generated like energy pennies, in, like competition energy pennies. And I think this just serves to show how powerful our number one strength is, even though I am like 50 shades of shattered, I have also generated pennies, which also... <laughs> Which also kind of means that my number one strength is a bit of a masochist. Like, I don't know. Anywho, so that's done. Um, I have to say, I woke up, I don't know if it was the next day or the day after. In fact, I don't even know what day it is now. But anyway, um, I woke up one day. Um, one day at band camp? No, anyway, oh my god, Sasha. No. Anyway, moving first swiftly onwards. Um... <laughs> I really hope that some of you get that reference and that you have watched American Pie. Uh, moving swiftly, swiftly or not so swiftly onwards, I woke up and realized that there are a few scenes that I still want to add in and there are some things that need polishing and some bits that I still feel need a, need a bit of work. Like I am resigned to the fact that this is not the book that I want it to be. I don't know how to make it that book. Um, I feel like The Scent of Death, which I've written about 25k in, I think, 25,000 words, is so much better than this book. But it's a different genre, it's a different tone, it's a different voice, it's been planned <laughs> much better. Um, and even though I love this book and I love Trey and I'm very proud of just slogging through it after it having taken me four years to do, um, I've kind of accepted that the book is what the book is. And so I'm okay that it's going to go out and it's going to be a good ending, but it may not be the best ending that I ever write. And I think that's okay because, you know, we grow and we develop and I, I wanted to keep the end of that series in keeping with the rest of that series. And I think I've managed to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I am really proud that I have finally got to the end of that series. Um, and I'm never gonna write another series like it. <laughs> Thank God. So yes, I have learned so many things and I probably, maybe I'll do a lessons learned. In fact, I probably should because I really like lessons learned and I feel like they're helpful to other people. So I will make a note of that and do that at some point. So before Christmas, I still need to do those extra words on tray and those extra scenes. I think it's probably only about 5,000 words. So it's not a huge amount. So I'll probably try and do that tomorrow and Monday. Um, and then I also need to edit Sirens, which is a novella. Um, in that series that's already written it's 19,000 words so it's not very long um, so I'm going to get that done as well and then I also need to edit all of the anthology stories I am a hundred percent determined to getting those done and back to the anthology the rebel anthology authors before Christmas um, including editing my own story and then um, I have a like beta read for my critique partner and that is it and I know don't fall over guys but I am actually going to take two weeks off I know it's fucking shocking um, Sasha taking time off I mean it's just it's literally unheard of but no I am doing it uh, not least because <laughs> I want to read loads of books before the end of the year but also because I just need some time off and some headspace and uh yeah thinking and planning about 2022 I have started to plan my direction for next year and I am very excited I don't really want to talk about it just yet because I am still trying to settle on a few things I think I've probably alluded to quite a lot that I want to go into a new genre and I've been thinking about strategies publishing models um, and what the best options for that are and I have not settled and that is unlike me because normally I would just like make a snap decision and then like start actioning it but no I'm being quite deliberative about this and I feel good about that because I think it is planned researched 
and it's going to like although I'm like I am kind of writing to market without doing the whole write fast publish re repeat thing I am going to try and be very intentional with what I do next year as a bit of experiment to myself so yeah we shall see we shall see and I'm still trying to make decisions about whether or not I want to start a new platform <sighs> spoiler alert I don't really um, and if I don't do that then what does that mean for marketing and, and how do I do that so I don't know if you guys um, have caught up with any of the uh, 20 books to 50 gay conference but there are some great uh, presentations at that conference and I will put a link in the show notes to the YouTube uh, playlist for that and um, that is where I that, that some of the sessions have been prompting some thoughts for me um, so yeah I think that is probably it I'm not sure I have anything else although I say that and then I'm probably gonna have forgotten something anyway I've been blabbering for ages so I'm gonna shut up and uh, move on okay rebel of the week this week is Aaron Aaron says um, I want to start by saying I love your podcast. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. It's one of my favourite drives to and from work. Oh, do you know what? I love knowing where you guys um, listen to the show. Uh, I've been tagged a few times this week in the Spotify... Uh, oh, I can't remember what it's called now, but like the summary. Um, and that has literally like made my hour or week or day or whatever whenever I've been tagged um and uh yeah I, I got to find out where some of you also listen which has been fantastic anyway it's not about me <laughs> this is about Aaron so let's listen to Aaron okay so Aaron says there have been um quite a few podcasts that talk about if I'd only when I was and I had felt this way for a long time but now I say fuck it no time like today so my rebel journey has just gotten started but I wanted to share some of it with you I have been writing for most of my life but never seriously enough to publish it uh, sorry to finish anything I have been in the IT field for 24 years and in 2014 I was done I left IT to pursue photography full-time during NaNoWriMo that year I was able to participate without the call of clients end of year oh shit now we have to spend our budget before the end of the year projects it was the third or fourth time I had joined NaNoWriMo but this year I won I put down 65,000 wo uh, words in my story Netherworld by April, nine months after my sabbatical began, we had four of our seven uh, blended children enter college. My wife and I decided that the steady IT income was needed for a bit longer, so I went back to the field. I struggled with Netherworld off and on for the next four years, never really able to go any further. I thought it was because my day job just sucked all the creativity out of me. However, in 2020, I had a personal epiphany and on Memorial Day weekend, I re-outlined Netherworld using KM Wyland's Scrivener template, tossed out all but 15,000 words, oh my goodness me, that must have hurt, and got to work. Because of the soul-sucking demands of IT, I would write between 500 and 1500 words on, a, on Saturday and Sunday morning from about 6 to 9 a.m. while the house was quiet. After seven months of early weekends and countless hours of, oh, Ludovico and Audi, I cannot tell you, like if I listened on Spotify, Ludovico and Audi would be the thing that I had listened to the most. I absolutely fucking lutely adore Ludovico and Audi. Um, I finished Netherworld a day after my 49th birthday. Oh my goodness, that's amazing, congratulations. I am now in the editing stages and almost ready to submit my first novel to agents, I think. Oh now, now Aaron, come to the dark side, darling. <laughs> come to Indy. You know you want to. Uh, yeah. Oh, I love this. I love that uh, you're saying fuck it to corporate life and to the day job and that you are pursuing this no matter what. Um, I think it's amazing. And also what a day to have finished um, your book as well. I love that. If you guys would like to be a rebel of the week and please be a rebel of the week. I do so love these stories. And once again, like we only have a handful left. Um, please do send them in. It can be any kind 
kind of rebellion, big, small, or something in between. You can email your rebel story to Becca, um, and you can catch her on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com, or you can Instagram me at Sasha Black Author. And I'm going to hit pause because I'm pretty sure that was my Amazon book delivery. No new patrons this week, but of course, I'm going to say a whopping, gigantic, big, soft, squishy thank you and hug to all my existing patrons. You guys are amazing. I love the community that we have built. I love the banter. I love the support. It is amazing. And yeah, you guys are just fantastic. And you bring a, a ray of light and joy and banterous piss taking. <laughs> to my daily life so thank you so much if you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes as well as random bonus content like random sprint days and I don't know what we did the silent September sprints I share bloopers sometimes I answer questions in audio all kinds of stuff then you can from as little as two dollars a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. All right, well, I think that's probably it for the intro. So let's get on with the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I am joined by Robin Pierce. For 30 years, New Zealander Robin Pierce, called the Time Queen by her clients, has shared her experiences and knowledge about time management with countless clients and readers around the world. Author of nine books, the first five with a trade publisher, and thousands of articles, she's regularly appeared as a subject specialist on television, radio, and podcasts. She learnt her subject the hard way through the years of raising six kids on a farm, single parenthood, and then a highly successful real estate career. Time management was her biggest challenge. The good news is she won. And with 17 grandchildren, she needs all her tricks to keep on track. As well as, well as learning to write fiction at 73 years young, Robin says she's bending her brain out of shape as she soaks up knowledge on how to be an indie publisher. Hello and welcome, you amazing, oh. fabulous, fabulous inspiration. Thank you so much for coming on. Grandchildren. <laughs> oh and my Most goodness. of them are petting me on the head now, <laughs> looking down on me. Well, half of them are. <laughs> um, oh my goodness me, that is. And what's the split of boys and girls? Oh, 11 boys and the rest are girls, whatever oh the mess is. <laughs> Six yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so your children, what, what, what's your split of boys and girls? Oh, my own children, um, yeah. counting, counting my foster son, special needs foster son, five boys, one girl. So wow. the ratios have basically continued. Yeah, <laughs> you are dominating you have, like men everywhere in your life. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. I, I am very excited to talk to you because time management is this endless topic that nobody can ever seem to get right. And funnily enough, I'm having a coaching call after our podcast because basically I want to do more. <laughs> Which I'm sure no, not more. <laughs> I know, I know, shocking no one. Um, yeah, uh, but okay, so tell everyone a little bit about you. How did you get to where you are today? Um, yeah, and talk to us about this sort of second career in fiction. Right. Well, a farmer's wife um, for 15 years, had the kids, foster son, as I mentioned, um, then single parent benefit which on the, in the far north of New Zealand, which was a bit of a shock, having been the, the, the worthy person doing um, fostering a child, and then suddenly I'm in the queue handout for government help. Um, ended up in real estate. The real estate was a really interesting uh, phase of my life because that was the thing that I came face to face with serious burnout and really did push me in the direction of having to do something about my time. A friend one day said in frustration, for goodness sakes, Robbie, go and get a better diary and, or a <laughs> decent diary. And that really, really triggered me because it wasn't the diary. It was the, it was the system that, that I was taught. Anyway, that's a whole long story. Um, as, a, as, as you did say, I've, um, 30 odd years or just on 30 years as a speaker, um, trainer, and a writer in, and a coach in time management around the world, which was really fantastic. 
mainly in Australia and New Zealand, I have to say, but I've done quite a bit of work internationally. Uh, the writing side of things, when I was a young mum, I, I had three kids at school, I had a small child with the push chair, I had a toddler in the push chair, and I had a, the last one in the oven. <laughs> and I attended a, a reading at my local library, and it was um, an author I admired. And I can remember so vividly as I walked out of the library with the babies, <clears throat> saying to the toddler, the little one walking along, one day I am going to write a book. <laughs> Uh, the children took no notice <laughs> and I just parked that thought it was I just knew I was going to be a writer one day then all sorts of things happened I touched on the, the career ended up years later when I was in time management and I fell into the writing really one of my workbooks uh, some the audience had uh, been using somebody showed it to a publisher they said, oh, yes, we'd be interested in this. But I think really my first book, which was published by Reed Publishing, the uh, at that time the biggest business publishing house in New Zealand, I think it was because the commissioning, commissioning editor had a problem with time management herself. <laughs> she liked my book, and well, my embryonic book. And so I got this um, contract to write a book. Uh, then the next one happened because the publisher pulled me into his office one day, said, Rob, I really like your little tips that you're sending by newsletter, your email newsletter tips. Would you do me a book on tips? So <laughs> that was the second one. And then it just kept on going. So they did five. And then Fantastic Company were bought by Penguin. I got my rights back a few years later, because Penguin weren't interested in backlist for New Ze obscure New Zealand people when they were like this huge international thing. And, um, and then in 2017, I started writing uh, historical fiction. And that's a bigger, longer story, which we won't go to get into today. But then a friend said, about a year later, said, why don't you look at indie publishing? I had been thinking, I had this dream of having my book accepted by the big international um, publishing houses because it was going to be so fantastic. Don't we all have that? <laughs> then there we are. Um, why don't you get into indie publishing? And by that time, I'd had a few rejections and I thought, why don't I? So I... I First of all, um, well, at the same time, actually, I revamped all my nonfiction. By that time, it was eight. I'd done some, a couple of self-published ones, three self-published ones as well. And I revamped them all. So they're all modernized, put them on Amazon, parked them, did nothing much with them because I was so focused on getting onto the fiction. But we'll talk about focus later. And yeah, yeah I just love learning about, I'm just soaking it up learning about indie publishing it's amazing uh, I I just love like I really feel like we are in the age of empowerment um but I love your story and I love that um so my friend uh Caitlin Duncan just wrote a book about take back your rights and that, she's on one of the episodes a few a few weeks ago and um I love that you are the living embodiment of like everything that she's saying and the fact that you can revamp and revitalize um your intellectual property um so yeah, I love that. Also, like as I, as I was listening to you talk about how you had three kids at school, one in the oven, a toddler and one in a pushchair, I was literally like, it is not fair that you look that good <laughs> after Thank that you. many children. Like, I feel like I look like a haggard old wench. Like, no, exactly, like you do one. not. <laughs> like, seriously, I'm applying like slathers of cream every night and I'm still going grey and getting wrinkles. Like, I oh, just well, can't accepted. seem to... Oh, anyway. I've, I've accepted grey and I've accepted wrinkles. They're just evidence <sighs> of a life well lived. <laughs> you don't look like you have any wrinkles. But anyway, let's, let's yeah. move on. <laughs> yes, um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so you are a time management expert. And so I am sure that you have like your own kind of definition of what time management is, like what it means to you, or like maybe what good time management is. So can you, like, how do you define it? Tell listeners how you define it. I'm going to give you just a couple of short sentences. Um, I suggest we think about time management as energy management, not time management. Because if we can manage our energy, we'll go a long way to managing our time. Um, use it as a filter. Really simple. 
Have you ever done your Clifton Strengths? I talk about Clifton Strengths all the time. I just wondered if you've done yours. Um, I have, but I have to confess, it's so long ago I can't remember what they were. <laughs> I'm very curious because I had never thought about like energy as a as a anything other than I'm tired or I'm full of beans. Um, and it was only when I did the Clifton Strengths that I started to think about energy and that if I was going to expend more by doing more, I needed to make more energy. So yeah, I love that you take that twist on time management. I think that is very wise. Um, okay, I would, so- I would add one other thing on it. I don't believe that it's about how to use a diary. But the, and I also strongly say there's no one right way. It depends mm. what your personality type is. It, it, and we go back to energy there again as well. It depends what your family circumstances are, your personal circumstances, what your health is. And that's, again, it comes back to what's going to be right for me, not what the books say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I suppose also in the same sense, what, what maybe what worked once won't always work for you as well. You know, as we we go into these different seasons in our life and you've got young ones and then you've got older kids and yeah, yeah. Okay, so what mistakes do you think that uh, people, creatives, writers in general make when trying to manage their time better? I'm going to take that question. It's a great question. I'll take it and look at it on two different levels. So there's the high level, and I think this applies to everybody in every sector. It's not just about writers. Is there are two opposites I've noticed? Uh, there's the sort that either that they, they'll either drift along, or it's in many cases it's not an or. It's because they're not understanding the principles of time management, and so therefore they're not achieving much. Or the other sort is <laughs> you fit into the sector. <laughs> try to do too much (laughs) too hard on themselves and burnout is the consequence and I know this because this was me (laughs) wow I feel called out (laughs) not how this podcast is supposed to go (laughs) I've been listening to your podcast for a while my dear grandmother speak here (laughs) wow okay yeah okay wow so maybe there is some truth to what you're saying (laughs) I'll add one extra thing is, and I don't, look, I know you have just had a lovely holiday in Holland because I have I've been listening. <laughs> but the second group, and so you don't necessarily apply here, my dear. I'm being a little bit cheeky for you. The second group, they don't prioritize time out. And they, so they burn out. Mm. Um, and, and, and so, and there's one other thing, actually, keeping moving, is the bright, shiny object. And you don't have to be a writer to get hooked into the bright, shiny, shiny object. I've spent thousands of dollars over the years on, think, on courses that I thought might change things. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I think, do you know, I, ha- I did have to learn that lesson, though, about time out, because um, I, I very definitely would guilt myself out of time out. Because if I wasn't doing, I wasn't achieving and therefore, you know, I wasn't making progress. But now that that was more the case when I was in a day job and desperate to get out. Now that I am out and I am happy, it is much easier to, well, <laughs> it's not easy. Easy, she says, I'm easy. listening to yeah, you. No, it's not easier, <laughs> but like it is comparatively easier um, to to take time away. I mean, what I find easier is to put fun things in that double as um, time out. So, you know, like taking my kid to a castle because I get inspiration from that. We have a family day out, like, you know, so yeah, I'm not, I am a, yeah, look, I'm a workaholic. I'm not going to lie. Like I'm a clear (laughs) workaholic. Um, It's so funny, but there's there's a whole lot of other things though. On a micro level for writers specifically, I've got a a few other things to add. Um, One is really practical um, down in the weeds one if you like and I've been learning this the hard way writing fiction because I could write non-fiction really fast I do write non-fiction really fast uh, is trying to edit too soon because if you if you get your editing brain on too quickly you end up as I found with the first novel taking out large chunks because they didn't fit the story arc so mm-hmm. being careful of that. Um, another one is a tip I got from a very um, capable writer called Jude Knight. She did, writes historical romance, lives in Wellington in New Zealand. Um, she's very prolific. She says every 10 minutes counts. You can get a lot done in 10 minutes. 
And that's I've shared that with other people. It's made a big difference for me because I just um, a quick extra few thoughts. All those little bits count up. So that's a good little one. Um, another one, a really big thing is focus. And I think if, there were, if we were going to talk about a theme on the session, focus would be it. So how it works for me, what I'm finding is that younger, smart people like yourself, you can work, you can actually work faster and cope with more in your brain. I think there's just so much in an older brain that you get a bit, almost a bit overloaded. But multitasking, I don't care what age you are, multitasking, which women for so many years have thought was a really cool thing is actually a really bad thing. You can do a certain number of concurrent things if one is not a high level thing, but to do to try and do multitasking on a number of things is it really a recipe for burnout. Mm. And um, so how that's really come, come to me um, on a really practical levels is things like how to promote. And there's been great advice from so many people like Joanna Penn, um, the guys at SPF, Mark and James, I love their podcast as well, David Gochran, Dave Chesson, um, Tammy Lebrecht, I soak up all these people. And you know, I'd say in terms of specifics, for the, find the promotion medium that you like and master that. Don't try and be everything to everybody on all of the social media. And all, the, all those guys, you as well, I'm sure. I can't remember specifically. But I've just finished reading Tammy LeBrick's book on email, Ninja Email Marketing, whatever it's called. Fabulous book, as everyone says. <laughs> and I, it actually gave me um, confidence to go back to doing email newsletters, which I've done for years. I've been doing them since... Um, we had email in, in the mid 90s I started writing email newsletters and I thought why am I farting around trying to get good at uh, Facebook ads and blah 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 you know all of the stuff the years of the bright shiny object syndrome coming in again in my head and I just pushed it back and so I'm now doing um to just I'm now doing two newsletters, one a week, one for my nonfiction, one for my fiction. And I'm just writing it back in the way that used to work before, being chatty, not trying to sell things. And that email newsletter thing, it's working for me. I'm getting people sort of coming from all over the place. It's amazing. So that's one. Um, I tried Facebook Live for a while because I heard Celia Mecca saying it was a really useful thing. Well, I did that for about nine months and just didn't get the traction. It didn't get me any extra results. So it might have worked for Celia. It didn't work for me. And don't, don't try and do all of the cool things that you hear about the services and the publishing platforms. Another example, I love Joanna Penn's work. And I know you're really good mates. She's always talking about going wide. I love the philosophy of it. I tried it. I've given up. I'm just focusing on learning Amazon. That's hard enough <laughs> for my brain anyway. Um, so, and, and, and the last one, and I've heard this so many times, when I wrote my first historical novel, I just wanted the world to know about it. And it was the best thing ever. But I'm not bothering about ads. I'm just getting on and doing what you guys all say is writing the next book, which is nearly mm. finished. I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> and, and I've even, in terms of focus, I've even not done anything with my lovely nonfiction, which has been really successful in the, in the publish, in the hard physical world. I've re-edited it all back in 2017, 18, 19, all re-edited. Well, actually 18, 19. And, um, and it's languishing. Things that were bestsellers were langu are languishing now because I haven't put the energy and the love into them because I'm focusing on learning this new craft. And that's how focus works for me. And it's, there's no one right way about it, but I just think it's such an important message. Yeah, I, what I love and the theme that kind of came out of that for me is about permission like permission to do it your way. And, you know, over the years, like I gave up. Like I had a whopping Pinterest account because for some reason they featured me because uh, I had an account very early on when they opened because I'm very visual and they featured me and I had like, I think it was like 1700 emails I woke up to because at that point, <gasps> every single time someone followed you, you got an email and I hadn't worked out how to disconnect it. And then like it, it sort of crept up and crept up. And I think at its height, I don't know, I had several thousand followers anyway, um, tens of thousands of followers. I don't think it's dropped now, but 
um, I haven't been on there in, in years and I, um, I, I, other than to search a few things and I just don't use it and I don't use Twitter anymore other than to just blast out sort of information, but I don't respond to people. I don't, I don't, I don't do tweets. The, you know, I've sort of parceled it down to Instagram because I enjoy Instagram. Although even on Instagram, I'm a bit shit and I sort of reply to four or five days worth of posts all in one go because I just can't you know you get so many notifications otherwise I'm, mm. I'm, I'm on my phone all the time um you know and I have the Facebook group and, and that's about it really because I don't enjoy the other things so I don't do them um the one thing I will say um ad wise uh is AMS ads I know you don't necessarily want to do them but for non-fiction even the auto ads are fantastic but we can talk about that afterwards Yes, um, yes, yes, I'm happy to have a coaching session with you. So <laughs> anytime. That's why I love being on your Patreon group too. I have to just give a plug for your Patreon group. Oh, what thank value you. you offer, my girl. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, one of the things I struggle with personally are boundaries. I'm not very good at creating boundaries because I just love to help people. I love to, to I don't know, influence impact people you know have a positive effect in people's lives so like do you have any advice about how to kind of set boundaries and work with boundaries both for yourself and then also ensuring that others respect them because I think half of time management is just about creating those chunks of time when you can work uninterrupted absolutely um one of the things uh, no actually you know I'll, I'll save one for later because I think we'll might come up later but the first thing I'd say is it, it's over to us to educate the people around us how to treat us um, that's clients it's friends it's family um, and especially as a writer when you start working from home well anytime really but it, it, it's yeah, when you do start working from home that becomes a really pivotal time to get that education in uh, example I just begun um, my time management business uh, in my uh, working in my own space my favorite auntie would uh, she rang me the very first day knowing that I wasn't now in an office at about 10 o'clock when she was stopping for her morning coffee and I knew if I didn't get up and nip that one in the bud immediately I was in for trouble and I had to say Peggy I'd love to catch up may I ring you after five <laughs> And it yeah. worked. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've shared that with a lot of other people over the years in different circumstances. And they've come back often and told me how they re-educated the, their, their loved ones. So that's number one. Another one, we're coming back to energy again, is monitoring your energy levels and working with them. So what gives you the best start in the day? What, if you're thinking about that, those sorts of things, that might help you um, put boundaries, protect that that space around you for um, your boundaries so that you can stay working productively in your high energy time yeah that is like that is one of my biggest frustrations because I know loads of people don't believe in in true night owls but truly I am a night owl and um one of the things that I'm struggling with at the moment is that I do a lot of night stuff like it is night time for us now for me now anyway it's morning for you um and last night you know I had the the under the whispering door masterclass with with the patrons and but the problem is but you know if I go until 10 p.m it takes me three hours to wind down so it's one o'clock in the morning before I go to sleep which isn't a problem for somebody like me because I'm still full of energy at one o'clock anyway the problem comes when my son gets up at 5 30 in the morning or he gets up at 6 30 in the morning um and because I have to take him to school and my wife gets up to go to work really early anyway she's a she's a morning person um I'm completely screwed and I it ends up taking me until like 11 o'clock to wake up because I'm like having to literally drip feed caffeine in um and yeah I don't really know what the answer is because I tried I've tried on a number of occasions to do morning starts and I just don't, I just don't enjoy them. <laughs> like I've done them. I can do them, but my brain doesn't turn on. Like I ended up not achieving an awful lot and I ended up reading less, which made me 
that gives me energy. So I just don't, I don't know what the answer is there. I don't think I have, I think it's maybe this is just a season of my life whilst my little one is little. I don't know. How old, how old is your son, Sasha? He is going to be eight at the end of this month. It's a busy time and they are still morning creatures. Give him another few years once he's a teenager. <laughs> oh my God, I literally cannot wait. <laughs> those hormones to kick in and for him to start grunting so that I can stay up late and get up late (laughs) I've got a few in the grunting phase (laughs) I've got a a tranche of grandsons in the teenage years (laughs) when does it kick in again and become lovely (laughs) yeah well I do have a thought for you though what about could you go back to bed after you've got people out the door could you go back and have another nap because I'm a huge fan of naps yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, the other problem is working every evening stops me spending time with your family. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I, that is, I have to say, on days where I've really like not had a lot of sleep, I will. But um, my body strangely tends to wake me up after almost exactly 15 minutes. Um, and the weird thing is, is I pass out as well. Like I put my head on that pillow and I am unconscious in like 30 seconds. It really annoys my wife, <laughs> but like I will sleep for exactly 15 minutes and then I'll wake up. And um, the only other time is when I sleep for like an hour and a half and then I mm-hmm. tend to be in trouble in the evening. Um, you're working, you see, you're working with your ultradian rhythms there. And in actual fact, a 15 minute nap is a very powerful thing. Oh, really? Absolutely. I've written about that in all my books or a number of my books and the stuff on my website, which we'll get to later. But yeah, you're working with the Ultradian rhythm. So we've got a, um, the, the an hour and a half. That's a natural cycle. And that's deep sleep. But if you can just take a nap for 15 minutes, you will revitalize yourself and you'll be able to keep going because you're only just getting down in, into the alpha state. It's almost a form of meditation. So yeah. that is a gift. Mm. That is a gift. Yeah. 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 Meditation is one I have. Um, I've sort of swung in and out of over the years. Um, but it it almost it feels is, like you just need to sleep. <laughs> yeah that is yeah it is true meditation feels like um an indulgence though and I know that's such a backwards way to think about it but I'm always like oh my six hours whilst he's at school are so precious smash the keyboard for as long as possible um but anyway right okay um let's talk about like the nitty gritty because I think in this day and age the biggest problem we all face is the abundance of interruptions notifications fucking emails which are my arch nemesis (laughs) like how how can we deal with this chaos well um, how many hours would you like me to talk (laughs) (laughs) i'll give you no truly i'm joking um there are um one of my books is getting a grip i've got a little pile here where are we getting a grip on the paper and email war (laughs) and There are seven chapters in here about managing email. So I'm only going to go really fast and give you some key points. Um, I've got a whole list here. I'll send them to you later on if you like, Sasha. So first of all, if if people go to gettingagrip.com, people being you, Sasha, (laughs) gettingagrip.com blog and type emails in the search box, you'll find heaps of information there. So that's a number one, real simple, cost nothing. Um, Number Another one is... And I, I've, I even had hate mail on this one to tell you <laughs> is don't do email first thing in the day. <laughs> oh, it hurts. <laughs> oh, now don't you add to the hate mail list? <laughs> no, I do know. Ex- it's just ex- so painful. painful. <laughs> it is painful. I know. I know. But the thing is, it's it's you're then giving permission to other people to take your best time. Mm. your 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 fresh brain well if if that is your best time there are some um provisos on this one though if it's essential for peace of mind a quick way to check is to look without getting sucked in because that's the danger is uh is to have a quick look on your phone if you've got email on your phone so you can have a quick scan see if there's anything super critical that's death defying and if it's something that you need to attend to later 
if you're doing it on your phone, or this is how it works for my phone, my iPhone anyway, is that I turn it back to unread so that when I synchronize on my computer later, I haven't lost sight of it. So that is one possibility. Another thing is do email at your lower energy times, not your most productive time. I love and I'm just whistling through my list here. I've got um, rules. I just love rules. They're a godsend to me. But you need to work out of your unread mail folder, not your inbox, in order not to miss things. And so I'm just going to reference chapter 24 in that book, Getting a Grip on the Paper and Email War, if you want to know more about that. But I can send you the whole book, which is fashion, no problem. <laughs> Um, I also still use folders so I can find things quickly, although the modern search functions um, are very good. And some of my email expert friends say folders aren't necessary, but I use rules to manage those. <coughs> so, so that's, I mean, those two things, it would take me too long to explain them, but they're, they're two things that really help keep what's it, what's, what I'm looking at on a daily basis um, manageable. Um, another email tip is using signatures. Have you? Do you use signatures or templates? Do you use them? Yeah. So I, in my email signature at the moment, I think it says that I reply on Wednesdays and Sundays, which I was very good at for a little while, and I've sort of slipped um, back. But it's because uh, my admin days have changed, so I just need to go back and and kind of tweak and edit that. And I also have an auto responder that says I will only reply on Wednesday and Sunday. Um, but again, I got out of the habit of that. <laughs> oh, well, this might serve as a wee reminder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the signatures you can use, it's not, well, that's an auto responder, um, but you can use signatures for a whole lot of other things. Think about them as templates. Like I've got about 12, no, I've probably got more than that now. Uh, large number of signatures so for example come up to Christmas um, I've got one that I can just it's you put the cursor in the appropriate place I've already created the signature and I just um, go up to my list and I just click Christmas greetings and there's text is all very best wishes for Christmas uh, blah 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 whatever it is I want to say and that lump of of um, text anything you in other words what it is anything you type on a regular basis can be turned into a signature so, and there are other ways to do it there's note the quick parts and there's all sorts of depending on your email client there are diff different ways to do it so go investigate your own email system um, if I get requests to for somebody wants to write one of their articles for me on my on my um, newsletter or blog most of them are just canvassing stuff and I've just got a polite little thank you very much but no thank you kind of thing um, and this mass is more driving directions these days we give um, we just use google google maps but when I first moved out into the country it was very different from giving a street address so I, there were several paragraphs of directions as to how to find me but I only had a couple of keystrokes um, another one is and this is a not a proprietary thing um, I've used it for years, it saves me thousands of keystrokes, is short keys. So I'm, I'm not on an affiliate or anything for it. They just love short keys. So just investigate that. And it's just shortkeys.com. Um, do you know how to do um, clicking and dragging a whole email into calendar? Do you do any clicking and dragging? No. Okay, this is a cool one. <laughs> I love sharing this one with my people. Um, you've got an email that says... Um, um, child needs to go to a school camp, let's pretend. Um, there are certain things that you need to do. You need to allocate a little bit of time to it. You can take the email, click and drag it down into your calendar. You've got all of the content is remains because it's an email and it gives you the option to set the time. So you're not having to retype anything. I did not know that. That is awesome. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, because the amount of times I have to leave shit unread in my inbox because I haven't paid for a school meal or paid for the children in need day or whatever. That would be amazing if I could just dump it in my calendar and then I would do it. At... Because it shows up. Yeah, because it's it, it, a reminder. It yeah, that's exactly right. Oh, well, well, there's a good one for you. I'm glad about that. I really love your autoresponder, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, you might not. You, 
you might not have fully educated yourself, but you're starting to educate us. And that's going back to the point that I made earlier about educating the people around you how to treat you. So I think that's really cool. Another big one, a lot of people don't do it, is turn off as many alerts as you can. You've talked about turning off the Pinterest ones and some of those others. Yeah. Turn, off, turn off Slack until you're ready to um, do it. And, and we come back to that focus word that I've been using already mm -hmm. uh, so that you have no interruptions while you're working on your high level stuff. Um, I just use the only messages are, uh, um, and notifications I've got are messages um, and messenger, which is mainly used by family and friends. So, so getting those things turned off. Um, another one is to blocking out, block out chunks of time where you do your email. So, and I try to avoid it. As I've said, I don't do it first thing in the morning. And um, just so we've talked about that a bit. The last one I want to say on emails is use Dragon or, or some sort of dictation service. And I know you and I've had a separate conversation offline about dictation. Um, I'm struggling with it. To, for my fiction for different reasons but mm -hmm. I'm finding with email you um it's so fast or or just type in ordinary stuff it's so fast because you can speak your mind and it's a little across the screen the only thing I've found with dragon is my headsets keep failing <laughs> the thing that I really love that nobody's ever said to me is so I'm one of these people that just likes the reassurance um, of seeing what's my what's in my inbox so I know what's coming. But if it's open, it's definitely a drain on me. Yeah, and absolutely. so I never thought to really look at it on my phone, but then sort of if I shut it down at night on the computer so I don't see it on the computer yeah that is that is I don't know why I haven't ever thought about that like, it just seems so fucking obvious now you've said it like just shut it on the computer and check it on your phone because I had it on my phone you know and also but you know I'm very unlikely to reply on my phone or do anything on my phone because it's a fact exactly. yeah yes. yeah that is genius I absolutely love that and I I am going to implement that I'm going to shut my email like before I go to bed tonight I'm going to give you one other thing you've just reminded me is most people don't know that they've got on their phone they've got the facility to speak an email or speak a search thing. So I'll just quickly tell you, and I can remember doing some work in England and they had the, the client that had booked me, went out of the room after I'd told all this group of men, um, CEOs of various organisations, and he came back a little while later and he said, I've been out there doing, speaking my emails, Robin's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and goodness, so, I love that. So what, what you do is, if, um, I'll just have, I happen to talk you through it by looking, I just pretend to be a, doing a text, is so you... Um, down where you're going to send a message anywhere, by the space bar, this is on an iPhone, it works on Androids as well, um, there's, a, there's a microphone button. So it's a cut down version of Dragon Naturally Speaking. You press the microphone button and what you're saying will show up on the screen. That is amazing. Um, I have to say, I didn't think I would ever really get with the voice, this audio kind of voice um, movement, but I am finding more and more. I actually blame my friend, Chris Kane, because she, <laughs> the first time she dropped me a voice memo, I nearly shit my pants because I was like, well, what is this? What is this monster doing? How dare she send me a voice message? And, um, and then the same week I had two other people send me voice messages in Instagram. And I was like, what are all of these people doing anyway I have to say I now more or less exclusively send voice I've stopped texting I just don't text oh. anymore I just speak all of my messages um and although that's not translating like I'm not uh using the voice to text I'm just dropping a voice memo to friends instead of uh, but it's so much faster because I can say what I want to say in like 10 seconds rather than spending five minutes sending a four page text if you like um well so I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to add an extra piece to that session because i'm not talking about pressing that that um little button over on the right hand side that gives a voice message mm -hmm. to text the you mean voice to the, text yeah there's down yes i do down by the space bar is the microphone button it's a mm -hmm. different button down at the bottom and that 
that converts it to text and that for the other person you're still as fast because you're speaking but mm -hmm. the other person can read it faster than they can listen ah i have everything on double speed so i listen in double <laughs> speed as well yeah, yeah but yeah. other people are not you think about the recipient yeah 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 i mean some of them do i think I think I will ask, actually, I, I know of a couple of people who listen in double speed, but I don't know if everybody does. So I will definitely use the voice to text for those who use more text, who read more text than they do listen. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's brilliant. Um, and I, I didn't even really know that that was a thing on my phone. Like I just... I, I sort of skipped straight to just voice memoing, but uh, yeah, I think I will, I will, I will have a go tomorrow when I send my first voice <laughs> memo. Instead of doing a voice message, I will like predict, do the the voice thing and get it to to predict about the text. Um. Okay, so you sort of mentioned earlier about not using planners, but what advice do you have for more effective planning? Like, no matter. How often I try and set a deadline for a book or a project, I almost always miss it. So like, how can I plan better or how can I plan more effectively? Great question. And I didn't say don't use planners. I, I was getting a decent planner was the thing that got me. It was learning the methods, it was the learning the philosophy behind planning that changed for me. And one thing I'll say is there's no one right way. There's no one right planning system that will work for every universal person just isn't possible um, so I think it's more important to teach people the principles now just the uh, the free easy way to get started on my um, thinking on this one I'll certainly give some info but I want to give people places they can go on my website getting it on my business website, gettingagrip.com, there's a free report called How to Master Time in Only 90 Seconds. And that does go through the basic principles of planning and prioritizing. Very quick, easy read. Now, a qualifier, you will be asked to enter an email address and you will go on my email list as a result. Of course, it's a capture device, but uh, you can equally unsubscribe as soon as you've got the report. So, <laughs> so anyone's a bit worried about that. So that's the first easy one to just tell you. Let me just give you one key point is uh, one of the key points in there is is doing the, what I call the one to five list. And it comes from a, a well-known story from a gentleman called Charles Schwab, who was the head of Bethlehem Steel. And I'm just diving straight in, by the way. I'm not giving all of the philosophy around because it, it will take too long. I want to give this one because when I've got people that come up to me years later after having either heard me speak or they've read something and they say that one to five thing, it made all the difference in my life. So right at the beginning of the day or even at the end of the day before, but certainly before you get started on your work, write down in no particular order everything you want to do for the day. Then identify the top five of those things. You might have 20 on the list. Just identify the top five. Start at number one. Don't go off it until you've either finished it or gone as far as you can, then on to number two and so on through the course of the day. When interruptions come in, you say to yourself, is this interruption more important than what I was working on or not? If it is more important, put what are you laughing at? <laughs> I just have never, I just, I just have never thought about that. I'm just, my mind is boggled. <laughs> Oh, really? Well, no, that is such a story. <laughs> no, I know, but like, of course you should fucking ask yourself that question. I literally have never asked myself that question. Like, is this, is this interruption more important? No, of course it's not. But do you think I've ever asked myself that? No, I have not. Like, oh, I'm, just, so cool. <laughs> I'm just boggled that I could have missed something that fucking obvious. <laughs> Wow. Oh, wow. Well, I had to learn it the hard way, my dear. Yeah. <laughs> I was probably I older I just than you when I learned it. <laughs> I think I just learned it the hard way. <laughs> Let me go back to my little well-rehearsed story. I've told it for 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> so you've asked yourself, is it more important or not? If it's not more important, put it on the list and stay focused on the work you're already doing. If, however, it is more important, put the other work aside stay focused on deal with the new thing and then go back not to just the next bright thing that shows up go back to the thing you were working on before um 
as you work through the day, you'll be readjusting your sort of your little list. And then um, if you're really lucky by the end of the day, you will have got the top things done plus appropriate cue jumpers. But the reality is for most of us, there, we will have not achieved everything. However, we have the satisfaction of going home at the end or going finishing work at the end of the day saying, well, at least I've done the most important things because you've started at the top. Yeah, I, I literally think I need a post-it that says, is this more important than your priority? Like, I just, <laughs> I'm still like tickled pink by that. I just can't believe <laughs> I just, what a question <laughs> well that's cool <laughs> yeah I, I just I'm shocked I just don't even know what to say <laughs> well I'm going to give you some praise I, I mean, you're beating yourself up for that one but look there's always a first time for every piece of information that comes up and I have to say you and your mate Joanna Penn whom I think is amazing as well I think you two girls have achieved more than anybody else I know. I think you're beating yourself up quite unfairly. Oh, thank you. I am. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I do. I am. I, I am the best at beating myself up. It has to be said. I, I excel at that. I uh, am one of these people who will never like I can always have done more. It's very tiresome. <laughs> I am well, I'm going to, I'm going, you're not tiresome you're amazing and I'm going to give you one more little tip on that one and it's watch the language because it really every time you say I don't get enough done or I, I'll beat yourself up that you're affirming that your subconscious is listening yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um, I've, I had a I had this rem- um, years ago I had a gentleman say it to me and I funnily enough I just did an email uh, newsletter about it just a few weeks ago looking at it again it's ask yourself at the end of the day what have I achieved rather than saying to yourself I haven't achieved enough Mm. so So, noticing yeah I am I I have a new planner funnily enough um and for listeners you're gonna hear some rustling of pages and um I've sort of talked about it a bit I can't maybe possibly on the other podcast though um and it enables me to um like the page is split into three so you have um space to to categorize tasks for the week so I have like um writing tasks and then a column for admin then a column for creation then a column for freelance then other then podcast then marketing and then it has like the middle band is like each day and so I put the tasks by day um and then you have like a space it's like a timed appointments along the bottom but I really like this because it's the whole week in one and I get to see all of the things that I've crossed off so that yeah. makes like me really happy to see actually I have done stuff at the end of the week right. um yeah, so I think that's really good. I hear uh, Becca Syme actually sometimes talking about a done list. I don't, I don't derive as much satisfaction from a done list, but I also keep. Um, I don't know if you can see this here, but I have a whiteboard yeah. for listeners on my uh, uh, on my wall, and I have like a goals complete. So anything that I complete that's like a big thing, I put that, and that stays for a whole year, so that I do, I can see at the end of the year what I've done, and then I wipe it off and start again in the new year. So I quite like doing that as well. That's great. So that's a visual affirmation of what you're achieving. Just watch your language as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So how how important do you think using no is to good time management? And do you have any tricks for for giving listeners more empowerment over the the use of the word no? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Actually, I think it is really important. It actually goes right up there with focus and energy in my head. Um, I, I actually say to people, and I've got a little business card. I, I, I don't think this goes out visually, does it? But I can show it to you if I can find it quickly. A little business card, which on the back has got eight. So there's my business card there. But on the, I always say to people, the useful stuff's on the back. The number one is no is your most powerful time management tool. Yes. And I, when I'm speaking it in a conference, I have a qualifier, but not in a career limiting or a relationship limiting way. So um, it's how to say no. It's how to push back, how to put, if we go back to that question you asked earlier about boundaries. So what boundaries are we putting around ourselves? And I'll give you a little example. Uh, 
one of the coaching clients that I worked with was senior man in a big engineering firm and very kind guy, empathetic, because the empathetic people are the ones who struggle the most to say no. And so Aaron, he was getting into trouble at home because his wife was getting pissed off. He was never around. He was always putting the extra yards and doing extra things on the weekend, et cetera, et cetera. And so I got him to his homework, if you like, was to practice saying no occasionally because it felt really uncomfortable. Peter, one of his colleagues, came to him at this around this time and said, look, I've got this really important report that I'm doing for XYZ client. Could you please, um, would you mind having a look at it? Now, it was outside of the normal work that Aaron did, and he nearly said, oh, I, I, normally he would have taken it home. But he, with my voice in his head, he said, looked at his diary. So that's another thing, is using your diary almost as a filter. And he looked at his diary. He said, I have got a gap on Friday afternoon. I could give you an hour. Oh, that would be fine, said Peter. That'll be absolutely fine. And previously, Aaron would have taken the whole thing home and he would have gone through it in fine detail as to what it needed to be. And he did this hour. He found a few things, handed over to the guy. The guy was perfectly happy. So we put it on ourselves in many cases. It's ourselves we need to say no to many times. Yeah, I never really... I never really thought about it like that. The fact that it's actually me that I need to say no to. <clears throat> One of the things, like, I love that you're talking about focus so much, but um, the way I've managed to be able to say no more is by having a really clear focus and goal of the big thing that I want to get done. And yep. because I want to win that got that goal so much, it enables me to say no and be okay with saying no. But I never really thought about saying no to myself. Like I quite, I quite like that that's going to be a bit of a fight and a bit of a like who's going to win like between Sasha and Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like I quite like that like I think I might have to say no to myself uh sometimes and also the reason I really like that is because it means I'm not saying no to somebody else I'm saying no to me mm. which makes it easier to do in a, in a way in a weird like paradoxical way yeah. if that makes sense it does and I talk about it a lot more in getting the grip on time management that's the first book that I wrote um and the one that's been the bestseller of this in New Zealand and Australia, we've sold over 20,000 copies of that. So it's um, it's got really practical stuff about this whole issue. And the first seven chapters are dealing in a broader sense with this issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, I suffer with monstrous overwhelm. Um, sometimes I sometimes it's because I write these gigantic lists and then other times it's just because I don't know it's Sunday and I've got a ridiculous week coming up and sometimes it's because I want to do all of the things so like do you have any advice on how to deal with overwhelm they one of them is, is possibly too many hats you're wearing um some things you can't negotiate you've got a family uh, you've got you've got a business there are things that you want to do but how many hats are you wearing and um, it might be some of those things are nice to do's rather than have to do's. For example, some quite a few years ago, I had a membership program, and I would I was, would interview people and write articles and get CDs made and put them in the mail and all of that kind of thing. And people loved it, but eventually I had to face reality that it it wasn't returning me the profitability that I needed and I sat down with my accountant and we did a bit of an ROI on income versus expenditure of energy and time and came to the conclusion that it really didn't justify it so so that was an example of um, what are the what are the must do's and what are the nice to do's and the membership program was actually a nice to do that really wasn't returning me what I wanted um, and I also, I learned it really hard, the hard way right early in my day, um, years as a time management specialist, in that I was feeling very overwhelmed. And I'm going, there's something wrong with this picture. I'm teaching people time management because people have come asking me for help. And now I'm starting to feel burnt out again. And I, I said to my then husband, what do you think about me um, getting a staff member? Oh, he said, you can't afford it. 
<laughs> people say I can't do something that always gets me interesting <laughs> and interested so I thought well let me see about that so I <laughs> well what am I actually doing I said to myself and I got a sheet of paper and I made a list of all of the tasks that I was doing I, I, I just took an average week but I, some of the things that I did on a monthly basis I, I had a, I amortized them so I, I worked out what I did in a week um, three columns. First column was the task. The second column was the amount of minutes per week, approximately, that I would do or would have done if that job were done the weekly. And the third column was how many hours of that could I pass over to somebody else if I had somebody? And I couldn't afford anybody at that time either, I might add. But what could be passed over to somebody else? And it was shocking. I've read a long list. The number of hours that I was doing was equally shocking. That was about 80 hours a week at the time. And I was just a new business. But the real shock was the final column because of the things that I could pass over to somebody else if I had that somebody was 40 hours. Fuck. Yes, <laughs> I said similar words, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But then what, so I, I'm really recommending you do that list, but it, and it becomes actually a job, um, a, a job spec for a, a, an assistant, in actual fact. It still left me with the problem of how could I afford somebody? But when the question is asked, the answer appears. Very shortly after that, a girlfriend in a similar situation, startup business, approached me. She was having the same problem. We found a young girl offered government work scheme. The government subsidised us half the wage. She had Lillian for half the week. I had her for the other half. So I didn't get 40 hours. I got 20 hours or thereabouts. By six months, because I'd managed to devolve some of the things that I was thinking I had to do, pass them over, um, in six months' time, I'd actually changed the shape of my business completely. And I ended up getting a different person working for me. Lillian went to work with my friend full time. And the girl that I hired was an experienced school mum who lived just down the road, uh, came into my office. Um, it didn't have to get into fancy clothes. You know, it's all different these days with so much digital stuff going on. And I only needed her for just over 20 hours a week anyway. And that's when my business escalated. I think it is one of the biggest leaps of faith that you have to take in, mm. in a business. And I sort of did a similar, um, I sort of did a similar thing um, in that I kind of calculated how much I earn per hour versus the cost of like a virtual assistant per hour. Mm. And since um, bringing a virtual assistant on, like my, productivity and my ability just even the headspace the headspace to come up with other creative things that I can do um is just immeasurable like I cannot explain the benefit it is it far outweighs what I pay um <clears throat> but funnily enough I think I'm at I don't know maybe 30 hours a month or like 20 20 I don't know, 25 to 30 hours a month. So I'm not even like, I'm only really using a week of somebody's time. Mm -hmm. um, but still that has made such a monster difference because the other thing is I'm not very good at the stuff that I've handed over. So the stuff that I handed over, instead of taking me 30 hours, was taking me closer to 60 hours a month because I'm shit at those tasks. And so it would take me forever to do them. Um, and so I've handed them off and somebody's able to do them in half the time. They enjoy the tasks and I get to do the things that I enjoy. And it's like a win-win for everybody. But for some reason, like I really held on to like the control <laughs> and not being able to like let go and the fear of like not being able to afford it. And, and you know, like it is, it is, touch and go for a little bit you do have to really buckle down for a couple of months but actually the amount of time that you get back is just phenomenal um so yeah yeah I do encourage everybody to uh to think about that and and to do that task as well okay we have been talking I can't believe it for almost an hour so this is the rebel author podcast tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel well, I did already tell you that I'm a bit wired to prove people wrong or indicated that I don't, when someone says I can't do something um, or they try to put me down. 
uh, in my 30s, when I was a single mother on a, on a government benefit, I had many examples of put down. And I'll just give you one. Maybe I'll send you some of the other ones because you keep sounding the podcasters that you're wanting stories. But anyway, this is my one for today. I was working in a um, local school library. Now, I am an ex-librarian. I'm fully trained school, li- foot, not school librarian, fully trained uh, librarian. The job that I had at the school was um, was um, working just as an administrator, getting paid seven dollars an hour. So we're not talking prince, um, princely sums here. The job came up in the local town library. The previous occupants had left under fairly um, dramatic circumstances, and I applied for the job. I. Um, went for a very daunting interview. There were about 12 people sitting, worthy dignitaries of the town, sitting around their big oak tables. And I was in a chair, fully exposed. <laughs> um, while they fired questions at me, I felt as if I'd done pretty well with my questions. I also knew, small town, I also knew that I was the only um, fully qualified librarian that had applied. The lady who was holding the job down at, since the previous woman had departed rather dramatically was a um, the wife of a well-known businessman. And I didn't hear back after I'd done, bus- done the interview. Um, I had, didn't hear back for quite a few days. And then one day I was walking down the uh, main street in a small uh, rural community and a neighbour who had nothing to do with the interviews called me over. Oh, Robin, she said, stuffing out her big fat tummy and looking at me very smartly. She said, um, have you heard about the library job? <laughs> and I looked at her in surprise. I said, no, I haven't. Oh, she said, they decided not to give it to you because you're a solo mother and they figured your solo mothers are unreliable. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I held my tears back. I was so mad, but I was so upset. So I didn't cry in front of her. I waited till I was out of sight. And I just got so fired up. Anyway, shortly after that, a girlfriend came to visit and she brought with her, um, no, she happened to have with her, yes, she did. She had a book by Shark Digger Wayne called Creative Visualization. Now, you've got to remember, this is back in the 80s. And at this stage, I um, had not had done anything with self-development. So this book, about, which was about visualization and affirmations, it just blew my brain. A little small book made such a huge impact. Well, I can tell you, I applied that process of creative visualization and within a couple of years I was in Auckland selling real estate living a really fine life and I'm so grateful to those people in that small town and to that arrogant nosy neighbor because they kicked me out of touch (laughs) into touch whichever way you say it depends what sport you're talking about but they got me out of that small town and that small town thinking yeah I I love that that. oh I love that so much because it it kind of echoes the things that people said to me back in the corporate day job which just fired me up to prove them wrong and and it's sort of like the longer the long game rebellion but I love that so much because it can literally change lives like we have the power to allow these things to crush us or to make us and I love that you you let it make you and that you proved them wrong and gave them the big fuck you as well. <laughs> I so did. It. <laughs> you really <laughs> did. You really, really did. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today. Would you like to tell everyone where they can find out a little bit more about you and your books and anything else you would like to add? Oh, sure. Well, I had mentioned my website a couple of times because there's so many useful things there. Getting a grip. Dot com. Uh, the, the, get, do get the free report, How to Master Time in Only 90 Seconds. It will, as I said before, we'll get you onto the email list, which you can get yourself off of any old time. But there's heaps and heaps of useful information there. For my fiction, which we haven't even talked about, um, except ever so briefly, I've got a separate website, Robin R. Pierce, because I've been listening to you guys, and so I've tried to keep the algorithm separate in Amazon. And the first book was called... Um, I, having a mental block (laughs) it happened on fifth street it's about it's historical fiction mostly set in america and it's basically about my um 
um, abolitionist ancestors who were conductors on the Underground Railroad. But more than that, we won't say. So there's a, there's a newsletter opportunities there and there's free samples of, book, of, of first chapters and all sorts of really cool stuff. So that's robinrpierce.com. Amazing. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes. Thank you so much. It has been an absolute delight chatting to you. Um, And of course, thank you to all of the show's amazing patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And of course, thank you to everyone listening. I'm and Sasha. Sasha, I will say, yes, the <laughs> Patreon stuff is, is even more amazing than you uh, on your podcast. So thank, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Robin Pierce, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm talking to Brian D. Meeks all about writing killer book descriptions. And oh my God, this chat is fantastic. I won't lie, it is quite a bit longer than my normal podcast, but I just cannot possibly delete a single thing or edit anything out because he is so funny, so brilliant, and there is a ruthless, ruthless analysis of my uh, first book blurb for Keepers, which I think you guys are going to find pretty fucking hilarious. And uh, I'm still licking my wounds. I'm still traumatised. However, there is a giant discount for uh, his book description course, which will be uh, all in the show notes next week. And, oh, he was just a treat to talk to. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. (laughs) 